What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. What did you say? Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. Welcome back to Rebel Radio. And today's guest, Paul Stewart, a.k.a. DJP. Paul Stewart's the founder of Over the Edge Books. You can check it out at overtheedgebooks.com. It's maybe the only hip-hop book publishing company in the business, really focused on on urban titles. And, uh, you know, Paul, as you'll hear, is, you know, hip-hop's in his blood. Everything he does, he's he comes from that culture, and he's made a career out of being one of the few people to really understand it and be able to move in it seamlessly and, you know, a lot of what he's done in music, he's now starting to do in the book publishing world, and we're going to learn about that here. Now let's go into the interview with Paul Stewart. Well, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Oh, man, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you, you've been, you were one of the first names that came to my mind when I, when, when I thought about doing this show. Uh, I got stories. I know you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you do, and, and you've been a big influence on me. And oh, and um, and you know, you're you're one of the people that I think like you know you have valuable lessons to tell. So hopefully, we'll get into some of that here sure. on yeah. Rebel Radio with our guest today, Paul Stewart. What up? What up, DJP? How you doing? Um, so, but let's talk about what we're just getting into. So, uh, you know, I know you're saying you have problems with the music industry and and record company people specifically and i had some of that you know when i was getting out of the music business Mm -hmm. you know i would tell people like oh i was doing management and then i stopped and everyone was like yeah artists are crazy right and it was just like you're babysitting and sure I, i never had that experience personally you know uh my artists were We're all adults they were you know everyone has their moments but but they were all great to work with and uh, you know i know you may have had a more diverse set of experiences with artists but uh, but i always felt like those weren't the people i had problems with it, it was, was the, the industry it, right right and it, it was, was the label cats that right. would show up an hour late it was to the their execs own office and everything right right yeah there's an amazing i'm completely unimpressed with both the people that work at the record labels and the management for the most part that's yeah. in the music industry right now i mean i just like there's an incredible lack of talent um, I think that the music industry got taken over by lawyers and accountants. And so at the top, you have these people that don't understand the industry. They're, they're mm-hmm. not creative people. Right. So they hire uncreative people underneath them. And you have these like ego driven maniacs that might be the nephew of the owner or, you know, whatever right. kind of like nepotism and, and just unqualified. You know, uh, if I had the budgets that those people had to make hit records, I mean, come For on, sure. you know, who couldn't hire go hire a hit song maker? It's ridiculous, you know. Yeah. Go find some talent like I did when they're on demos, you know. I mean, I discovered. I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I've discovered. Go ahead. You can brag. <laughs> I've You've discovered people that sold more records than pretty much almost all of these A and R cats. But because if you count discovering records on somebody that already has a record on the radio in another right. city, that doesn't count, you know. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's not really just. That's like. You know, research. That's not like listening and discovering talent. That's not right. like having an eye for talent. That's like noticing a trend that something's happening. It's like paperwork. It's like right. you know. So uh, well, let, let's let's talk. I, we only have an hour, so okay, we sure. can't we can't go through the whole resume. Okay, sure. That would take our whole show. You're sweet. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, highlights. Yeah, let's go through the highlights. So you know, when, when I met, when we first met, you know, I knew about PMP street promotion company Mm -hmm. and i knew you were doing clubs right uh we got introduced i don't know if you remember through matt jones Mm. who i was interning for at the time at motown i do remember that and he was like oh you should meet paul stewart and you know i knew of pmp but i i didn't know anything about you and and uh and so you know i knew that you you had like a big thing going locally in la and I, i really didn't know any more than that but but you know you had that going and then you I could give you the real abbreviated, just kind of, you know. Let's do it. Uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, proud to be from the Crenshaw District, with <laughs> the few white people <laughs> from that area. I don't have no thug life tattoos or anything. I don't run around, but I'm from the hood. The nice part, you know, I'm from the nice part of the hood. So that's kind of a rare thing. But uh, I started DJing 
early when I was in college. I won't give any years away. But uh, uh, very early, fuck it, 82. Can I swear? Sorry. Yeah, you swear. All right, so, um, you know, I started DJing. I started doing street promotion. And then I started managing artists. And I discovered, through the course of doing street promotion, I kind of, like, started meeting artists and stuff. And so I discovered a bunch of artists, you know. Uh, I was their first manager, you know, basically from demo tapes and stuff, you know. Far Side, House of Pain, Warren G, Coolio uh, were all management clients that I discovered. Montel Jordan was signed. I discovered him was signed to my label. I later got a label deal with, with Def Jam. I opened up their West Coast offices. Uh, you know, um, I sent them Domino and other things. So I was involved in a, you know, I helped other local groups like Freestyle Fellowship get their deal. I, I helped a lot of groups get deals. Um, and I discovered those artists that I mentioned. And in the course of that, I started music supervising films. My first one was Poetic Justice. Now I've done like over 40. I did recently uh, Dear White People. I've done like Fast and Furious 2 and a gang of stuff. Uh, Hustle and Flow, we won the Oscar. So those are kind of the, the highlights. And now I have my book company, Over the Edge Books, which is kind of something that I'm just really putting tons of my energy into. And, you know, and just trying to document the culture and... and um, and do it the right way. So instead of complaining about all these other people that aren't representing the culture right, let me right. let me do it my let me try mm -hmm. to do it the right yeah. way. You know, yeah, that's great. Well, I, there's a lot in there that I want to dig into, but so talk about Over the Edge first, okay? Because that's the newest project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I think so it's pretty excited about it. What you're doing? Yeah, well, you know, a couple of years ago, I had started producing films uh, from music supervising films, and as a manager, I had hired. I got really interested in filmmaking from the music video side. I hired like. Gary Gray to do his first video, Paul Hunter to do his first video, Dave Myers to do like his first real video. So I never got a pretty good eye for the visual, the same mm -hmm. as ear, you know. So I was really, got really interested in just like, you know, filmmaking. If it was small little videos or movies that I was working on as a music supervisor and I wanted to produce films. And so I started to produce a couple films and was just really frustrated with the process. Felt like I had worked on all these movies and I saw how they were done. I saw how the studios did on the independent movies. And I felt like the people that were making the movies didn't understand our culture. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about urban culture, basically. Mm -hmm. That tends to be the stuff I work on, you know, or even broader, let's just say youth culture, you know. And so, um, I wanted to I wanted to produce things and I decided that if I put things out as books that maybe we could get like a Marvel S kind of thing going in the urban world where we'd be putting out all this cool content and then the film studios that would come to us instead mm -hmm. of me trying to beg them and play that silly game like you know I wanted to control the content from the early stages let it come out the way it's supposed to be yeah develop it so that the projects can be shown there's an audience for it. You know, some of our books maybe will be documentaries, hopefully some maybe will be turned into feature films, you know, some of that's starting to happen, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've put out like 30 books. We have Darlene Ortiz's uh, memoirs, Ice-T's First Wife. We're really excited about that. We did a deal with Murder Dog Magazine where we're re-releasing re their content. We have like pictures of Little Wayne. He's like 13 years old, no mm -hmm. tattoos and stuff. You know, we got some mm -hmm. exciting content. Uh, we have a book by this local photographer who uh, was uh, Deron Jackson, who was following uh, Kendrick around from kind of like the MySpace days. And so like we have like ASAP and Kendrick on the cover and that kind of has like all the new school artists. And so just trying to put out, you know, um, just kind of a voice for people that maybe major publishers don't understand uh, okay. uh, their relevance or, you, you know, letting people do things. I believe in let artists do things the way they want. Yeah. I tried to create a format where it's like a 50-50 profit split, so it's a much kind of new school, digital age kind of deal for, for mm -hmm. the uh, content providers as opposed to like the old school industry, like, yeah, you know, kid, you know, we own everything, here's some little Cadillac money, and then, right. you know, you don't get anything else. No matter how right. much it sells, you get yeah. screwed, you know, and so I just tried to create a, a new business model uh, that could work for everybody and, um, I'm just thrilled about it, you know, um, just being able to put out people's stories the way they want to do it. And yeah. it, it's great because it's kind of like, you know, I can do music, art, you know, I, you know, I love music, but I have a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can, you know, we do a lot of music stuff, but we do stuff that's not music too. When, yeah. when you say like the bigger publishers can't properly document like the urban community, what do you mean by that? Well, Mainstream culture in general, I mean, I think just like the mainstream media, excuse me, in general, I think just doesn't do a very good job of kind of like, um, well, first, there's just so much institutionalized racism in regards to like urban culture, you know what I mean, and hip hop and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I, so there's, there's that. And it's just kind of the people that, 
control, let's say, because this started with my frustration of films and TV that were being made, but it's mm -hmm. equal with the books that are being published. It's just a lack of understanding of what's important and what people are interested in because right. they're not in touch with this culture, this world. You know, right. it's um, it's one thing to study it and like look at, oh, this is charting or kids mm -hmm. are into this, but when right. you live it, you know what's going on and you talk to people. And, you know, so most of the people that are the decision makers is like, oh, we're going to publish this book. This is the movie we're going to decide to make whatever have a total disconnect to urban culture sure. so they're picking things based on what they you know what i mean yeah, so basically right. just have the wrong people making decisions right. you know what i mean and a lot of those people are racist on top of it and like right. you know and their stereotype views and you know so you know like and, and, and i'm thrilled that straight out of compton got made and i think it's incredible for uh, hopefully what i'm doing you know mm -hmm. what i mean and mm -hmm. that it was yeah. so successful and everything and showing wow there's this huge interest in these stories uh, young kids are interested and you know mm -hmm. there's this huge audience and stuff yeah. and you know and so uh, because I think a lot of that was a real battle for them to get made and look how successful it was you know what I mean and yeah. and and there's a lot of other stories like that that um, probably won't get told unless maybe me or someone like me you know yeah. steps up to the plate and mm -hmm. well that's one of the things I love about I mean I think you're doing some great uh, some some great books thanks and but one thing I, I love about it is like you know, there's like you're saying, there's an entire market that's been overlooked that uh, not by chance, right? By structurally the way the publishing industry works, right. they're not set up to recognize this culture. And yeah. I think, you know, if you walked into I mean, I've I've never sat with a book publisher, but I would expect them to just assume that, you know, black people aren't reading books right. or that you, right. you know, right. aren't reading. Books. Right. Well, we get a lot of that, you yeah. know, for sure. Um, well, also, too, just thinking that the only people that are interested in this kind of stuff are black people. Obviously, Absolutely. you know, that, that's a, a misconstrued sure. notion, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, you know, I started, I was inspired by a couple companies when I started the company. One of them was Marvel mm -hmm. because they create their content um, and it, they, like, and because they put it out in printed form, mm -hmm. similar to what we're doing, and their comic books lose money, but they make so much money sure. on the ancillary products. So mm -hmm. yeah. part of my deal is to look at things in a brand, and I'm not doing such a heavy-handed deal that Marvel does, where they own everything. You mm -hmm. know, it's a buyout from the artist and everything. Mine's, you know, a more fair deal. But yet yeah. we're in, but it's different than the traditional publisher because we are involved mm -hmm. in the other areas. But we also are bringing those opportunities as well. So, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I just think that, uh, you know, the, the the major publishers and companies like that, I mean, you know, are just so slow to recognize these kind of things and stuff, you know, that you know, hopefully I can build this up. And then, you know, maybe a company like that would want to acquire us or something. But, you know, to, to, to your point, too, so the content that, that we're making, we create videos to, you know, promote every book that mm -hmm. we do, right? You know, um, you know, we, we have a blog on our site that, you know, talks about relevant, you know, things to our audience and stuff. And so in that regard, I also kind of like um, uh, uh, was very influenced by Vice Media mm -hmm. because I looked – something you said just – the reason I believe Vice Media was so successful is they appealed to a demographic that was being ignored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Point blank. that That's why they're successful, right? Sure. Sure, it was a magazine and it went to a website, right? But that's the key, right? Yeah. Like if you look at their success, that's the key. So – I feel the same way about our audience. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and so that, so I look at it like maybe they won't read the book, but if they watch the video, right. we're mm -hmm. getting views and, you know, it's all Absolutely. content, right? Yeah. You know, maybe we'll be able to sell this story for film and TV rights that they'll go see or something. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or something. So, and I also just think that, you know, uh, uh, I mean, there's a huge street lit market. I mean, you know, uh, you know, yeah, people are, you know, reading is certainly not like probably going in the right direction, but all the more reason for my company. I'm one of the few companies that makes books that kids that aren't reading would want to learn. Right. Hey, government, give me a, a give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get these kids reading. You know what for I mean? Sure. Like, can yeah. I get a grant? You know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so to that point, you know, I think um, my answer to that is like they don't have to read the book. They right. could watch the video and yeah. we could still, you know, generate, you know, yeah, the message. Is right. Clear. And from a business standpoint, generate income from it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, you know, with the, we did a deal with, with Pimp C's estate. Uh, unfortunately, another book came out uh, that uh, his mother was working on with Julie Beverly before our book. So we're repositioning what we're doing and everything. Mm -hmm. But I got him, uh, I got the estate, you know, merchandising deal with Black uh, Scale, you know, a record deal with Decon. Nice. You know what I mean? Right. So there's all these kind of like, you know, yeah. things that we can ancillary kind of like revenue streams or other ways that we can potentially 
um, you know, get these brands moving. So, you know, even and, and, and the way we're doing the books, you know, they don't cost us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So it's okay mm -hmm. if we don't sell tons. Absolutely. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Because they're all profit. Sure. We're not we we're not operating under the old medium of printing up a whole bunch of books and shipping them to bookstores that are going out of business, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and left, and then and getting returns and stuff. We're we're, right. we're on a, we're on a print on demand kind of model, so you know we pay a little more per book, but it, it's been allowed me to, you know, just tell people, yeah, I can make your book, and, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and then mm -hmm. if. If it happens, if it hits, great. You know what I mean? Right. If not, I didn't lose any money or I, I lost right. so little it was okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, I want to go back and kind of – Talk about music. Get to how we got to this point, yeah. right? So um, so like I said, when, you know, when we met, you know, in my mind you were already, you know, running L.A. Um, that right, nice, was nice. that would have been 91. Yeah. Uh, so – so, but let's go back to the beginning. Sure. Um, how would you – how would you get – First of all, like, uh, when did when 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 did music really start impacting you? Oh wow! When I was a kid, you know, I was huge into music. When we were little kids, like elementary school, we used to buy forty fives at the warehouse on La Brea, yep. and I had a very diverse taste, like Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, the Carpenters, the Bay City Rollers, oh, wow. like all the way to the best to the worst, yeah. you know. But I always had this kind of pop ear and really good stuff. Like I said, like the Stevie Wonder. Do you and remember stuff the too. first record you bought? Uh, the first album I bought was Sgt. Pepper's on, oh, on, on vinyl. But I had been buying those 45s for a yeah. little before. But, yeah, I, re I distinctly remember buying Sgt. Pepper's. I was 13. I bought it at a used record store uh, on PCH. Um, but um, I um, – music – my brother was really into classic rock. And so, you know, at like 13, like around that age, you know, that's when I really got into it with him. You know, that's when – you know, we started smoking reefer. I started very young, you know, and, and, and we're listening to all this Jimi Hendrix and Beatles uh -huh. and all this like mind expanding. Like my brother was into like older music, like 60s rock. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I got turned on to just Rolling Stones, Beatles. And, and, and I had a young friend in junior high who was really into Beatles. And so I got really into like that, you know. And mm -hmm. then I started hanging out with kids from my neighborhood as a little older. And then I got, they were turning me on to Rick James, Cameo. And so like funk and all that yep. stuff became really, I got really into that. And I was listening to, I was listening to rock, I was listening to like Ozzy Osbourne, all kind of stuff. And then, and then I went away to college and, and the guy comes over and goes like, you guys always playing your music so loud. Why don't you do the music for the dance? And I started DJing. And so the first dance, it was crazy. I had made a tape where like you pause it right at mm -hmm. the end of the song, you know? Yeah. And then, and then I, mix. so I had a turntable and a tape deck and the mm -hmm. turntable was just to play one record when I, when I flipped the tape deck. Yeah. yeah oh so gosh. I did the dance and for killed sure. the dance. And then I, and from there I started DJing. What'd you, know? you play in that, in that set? Oh man, it was like fifties rock, like rock around the clock. It was like, yeah, it was like Rick James, B fifty twos. You know, it was like New Wave was like, oh, you know. So it was an exciting time. It was you know yeah. eighty two. You know, it was like, you know, we had we had Sugar Hill Gang records. There was there was a guy, in, in, in our dorms from San Jose, Leroy Worthy, and he had a crate, and it was like every hip hop record that come out right. at that time. He used to let us borrow it for the dances, so we'd play we'd play his stuff, and it was like you know, it was it was New Wave. We were playing like I said, Motown. 50s rock you know it was a little you wow know, yeah that's cool yeah it was it was diverse you know it's funny because now i think there's this uh you know a lot of the walls have come down around genres right right and that the popular conception is that that's a new thing mm. right but but i feel like it's not i feel like you know i had a similar background to yours uh and i was exposed to all different types of music and you didn't really draw those lines i mean Right, right. No. Well, it's interesting. I think it, it, it kind of depends maybe where you're from and some things like that, you know. But yeah, like, I mean, like Leroy Worthy and his friends, I mean, they were definitely listening to all kind of other stuff. Like, they gave me the crate so we could play some of the hip hop, sure. you know what I mean? Like, sure. they wanted to hear their shit at the dance, you right. know what I mean? But yeah, because well, there was tons of other stuff, you know. And, yeah. and there was a lot. I mean, you know, MTV and, you know, I always say that Madonna and Michael Jackson's threw um, changed a lot because to me, I felt like before then it was more segregated because it was like white music was guitar driven and black music was like dance, like beat driven. Right. And after the Madonna and the Mike, it all pop music became beat driven. Sure. There, the rock kind of went out yeah. the window you know i mean there, i guess people were listening to hair man but i wasn't you right. know what i mean so i didn't like at that when people were listening to like uh what's the, what the big hair metal band like guns and roses kind of thing even before them like um i missed all that yeah i was like totally in the but i, I was in the hip-hop i did and, too but but i yeah, had like an iron mate no not 
Is that yeah, Iron Maiden, Judas yeah, Priest. Yeah, I don't know any of those groups. I don't like any of that stuff. It's funny, like... That I love old, like, Jimi Hendrix shit, but I don't yeah. like any of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I it wasn't for me, but, but it's funny, like, I got introduced to that music through the Cholos. Mm. Because, you know, growing up, you know, and, and you know, we're in, like, fourth grade. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody, it was all soul, right? It was oldies. Right, right, you right. You know, and then... You know, all of a sudden, a couple of the dudes, like, you know, they just start showing up rock. in Aussie t shirts and Metallica. Right. right. And, you know, Metallica's from San Francisco. So they were like the local band that, right. you know, was credible. And, and it, but it was all the Cholos that were into that stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, no, well, for me, what's funny I was so I grew up in a black neighborhood, and you know, like they 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 took they took me out of the schools. Like when I was a little kid, I was like the only white kid in elementary school. Yeah. Then they took me out and put me in schools on the west side, and 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 I met. I started hanging out. The first time I really knew Mexicans was when I went to junior high, and it was mm-hmm. it was it was whites and Mexicans, and so I was just amazed at how these young kids were listening to all this old music. Like right. that blew my mind. Like I was at that time, I was still listening to the Beatles and everything mostly, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And then they were listening to oldies. I was like, wow. These mm-hmm. young kids and old me, I just tripped me out. Mm-hmm. And then when'd you get into hip hop? How how'd that happen? Well, like I said, bef- when I was in high school, I started hanging out with some cats from like kind of like Slauson and like La Brea area around there that I had met on the bus coming back from Venice. That was kind of closer to my neighborhood, you know. Yeah. And they turned me on to all the funk and stuff because hip hop wasn't really happening right. out here yet, you know. Sure. I'm old, man, you know. So anyway, we were listening to Rick James and all that stuff. And so I really was getting into black music and funk right. and everything. And then when I went away, then I went to college and that's when I started DJing and that's and that's when it happened. I remember right. when I, I saw the rock box video mm-hmm. by Run DMC because I was already into rock and yeah. car, like that like blew my mind. And yeah. then when the Beastie Boys came out, it was like not that I cared that they were white so much or whatever, but their whole sp- partially because I was a skater, yeah. so their style like appealed to me because the the rap style of all the like suit clothes, I like that was so like I was wearing dirty shorts right. and thought that was cool, you know. What I mean? We was For a sure. skater culture, so when the Beastie Boys came out, it was just like yes, like I'm here, I get it, I can dress like this, this is my whole culture, and then I just like everything else went out the window. Mm-hmm. I was like super hip hop, you know? yeah. It was like I found my. I went through a lot of phases, you know. Sure. First, I had the long hair. Then I, then I had B fifty twos. You cut all the hair off. You're like, I never went punk rock, but I was kind of like, you know, new wavy and then you know, yeah. thrift store clothes and you know, uh-huh. ska. I was in the ska. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? It uh, was so. Was there a moment? Was it rock box or was there a moment or a record that you were like? Yeah, I'm running MC rock box. I saw is, the video on MTV. Me. And I was just like, wow. Just yeah. blew my. I mean, I mean, first of all, like you know. Those guys were way advanced with their rapping skills compared yeah. to what had been coming out. So all of a sudden, you got these guys like busting. Like before, mm-hmm. it was like this party hip hop shit, mm-hmm. and then these dudes are like busting. Mm-hmm. It's like a whole new school. Like you know, and then with the guitar and everything, I was just I was all in. I was right. sold. You know what I mean? And then so, uh, was there a certain point when you decided that that was going to be a career, or how did that oh, happen? Oh wow, no, not at all. In fact, it's funny. I tell people like I never in my wildest dreams thought I could make a career from hip hop. The whole right. idea was completely unfallible. Yeah. Like the music that your parents hate or whatever. Like you mm-hmm. know, like come on, what? But no, I um not at all, man. I, I didn't even have a, a a dream that I could make a. And it's crazy because I was DJing. I was a twelve inch buyer. I was promoting concerts. I was throwing dances at the school. I, right. I was doing all these like things that like if you're like a young guy want to get in the music industry that you would do. But yeah. I didn't even, I, I didn't, didn't even know, know there were jobs in the right. music industry. Yeah, I was so. Fun. My father was an engineer. I grew up in Baldwin Hills. I didn't know anything about Hollywood or the mm-hmm. music industry. I, I didn't even, I, to be honest, I, maybe I'm dumb. I didn't even like, wow, people make the records. Like, yeah. I, the thought had never even come in my head. I had you know the what same I mean? experience. Right. Yeah, and so, you know, when I got out of school, actually a friend of mine uh, who was a photographer, we started this little magazine called the LA Informer. There are only two issues, but we interviewed NWA and Latifah on her first trip to LA. Nice. We did some pretty, yeah, we got these crazy NWA pictures. And we and we interviewed NWA, it's so crazy. They were like, can we take our guns out for the pictures? And we we're like, sure. And they were like, <laughs> no other press would let us take yeah, the guns out for pictures. How amazing is that? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't crazy. that early. Right. You know, they had already been in like Rolling That's Stone wild. and stuff like that, right? You yeah, know, but yeah. no guns, you know. We were like, hell yeah, take them guns out, you know. Right. But uh, yeah, so I did that little magazine and I was DJing. I'd started to like, 
you know, get some. I had met Matt Robinson, and he had started to put me on a little bit into mm-hmm. some cool. I was DJing at clubs where they're like famous actors and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was starting to like because before then I was DJing at the worst shit, you know. And then so, and then <laughs> right, and then I met this guy. I was working at this little record store called Cranes on Pico. The dude felt bad oh, yeah. for me. He gave me like two hours a week. He, I just hung out there so much. He felt bad. Yeah. And I met this guy from Arista, and I was like, "How do you?" And he was like, "Well, we need an intern." And so I got that job at Arista. At, at Arista in L.A. Yeah. Wow. And it was super corporate. Yeah, super. We worked like sure. fifty hour, sixty hour weeks for like a hundred dollars a week. Yeah, doing like. Wait, so how did that work? Like being in such a corporate environment, coming from like street promotions. <sighs> I hadn't started street promotions yet. That came oh. later, actually. So this yeah. is Arista. Like what, what? I just graduated from college. What was the roster like? Oh, what Millie Vanilli. I'm promoting Millie, Millie Vanilli. Uh, we had some really bad hip hop, but we did have we had three times dope. They were cool. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but everything else was like. Oof. Mm-hmm. Canine Posse. Oh yeah, Canine Posse. Uh, we had some wax shit. But, but that was uh, somebody's brother. Somebody was involved. Was, was yeah, it was somebody's brother. It was like mugs and Bobcat or somebody. Oh, okay, was that's right. Signed, but no, Canine yeah. Posse was like somebody's brother. I forget. Okay, it. but um, anyway, so I was calling record stores and just saying, hey, do you got Millie Vanilli in stock? Uh, if not, here's a poster. You know, yeah. Try to put us up on the Billboard charts a little higher. That was before SoundScan and everything. So I was doing retail marketing, right? You know, and um, you know, just learning the business, learning about the business, kind of the politics of the business. At the same time, my DJing thing started to take off, where I was actually doing fly clubs and stuff. And I remember one time I met Arista, and I was doing that club Water of the Bush at the time, where I was mm-hmm. more involved as like a. I was just part of the thing. I DJed a little, but I was kind of right. like night manager or yeah. whatever. I was part of the team that you was know, that Ice was Ice T involved. Ice T in was involved. In, yeah, they were. Yeah. That was like their club. Yeah, and so um, and Violet Brown, who was a big deal, yeah. she bought all the music for the the warehouse chain. All the black music for the warehouse chain was huge, you know. And so like for I worked with the retail side, right? So. She called one day for me and my boss's boss because she wanted to get on the list for Wild the Bush. Right, freaked the fuck out. Like, why is Violet Brown calling the intern? Yeah, you know? oh and these God, dumb motherfuckers sure. didn't even take advantage. They called me in the office. They're kind of like cussing me out. Right, like what? And I said, "Well, yeah. she's gonna list for the club." And they're like, "Oh wow, you got juice like that out there?" And it was like, "Okay," but they didn't use it. I mean, like you know, right. I didn't, you know, it's so right. silly. You know, I knew more about hip hop than anybody in, the, in my little pinky. Anybody in the whole building, I had like for sure zero input into anything That's badass. Mm-hmm. but you know yeah i learned it was That's cool and then from there i got a job at delicious vinyl which okay. was great i'm working young mc's album i go to new york for the first time new music seminar i meet people like baby chris lighty who's like jungle brothers road manager um you know i'm just it was great because I came like a guy from L.A. that was down with all the New York hip hop cats. So they'd be like, "Where should we have the third base listening party in L.A.?" Where you know? So I w- I I was writing for the Source. Mm-hmm. By that time, I was writing the L.A. Comment about what's happening in L.A. Mm-hmm. and that really helped me kind of get my juice up in the hip hop industry. And that's why I'm like cool with all these old school cats. That, you know what I mean? That would still yeah, give me sure. love. You know, yeah. because it was such a small circle back mm-hmm. then. It's interesting, you know, delicious. Uh, you know, now is a pizza parlor. Right. Right. Um, but. Mike Ross, I want to check. I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody I'm mad. <laughs> All right. We can talk about that. But, but. Uh, it's okay. But, you know, Delicious is. Um, like, it was really the epicenter mm. for, you know, for LA hip hop at, at that time, right? Like, like you said, that, you know, they had Tone Vogue, they had Young, Young MC. MC. Those were major hit records. I don't know what kind of sales they did, but. Oh, it was but those huge. were crossover. Those were pop records. Oh yeah, it was some of the first big pop, right? Crossover pop re- rap records in yeah. existence. Yeah, it was huge for this tiny little label. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's a tiny little label, and you know, you came out of there. I think uh, Rifkin. Rifkin was upstairs. Okay, he had his own company, but he was totally affiliated with. Right, it. right, right. He was running a street. In fact, Rifkin was like the first guy to get hired to do street promotions nationally, right. and he hired me to do LA. Yeah. And used to pay me like 50 bucks a record. But he had like the Electra stuff. So it was like Brand Nubian, Pete Rock. It was like yeah. this amazing record. So, yeah, I was kind of mad at Steve because he didn't pay much. But his records were so good. It was <laughs> sure. like. The, and all these DJs. You didn't have to pay. All these DJs come to me and they're like, dude, I came to your house. I got Cypress Hills for album. I got, you know, I got bust. I got Leaders of the New School vinyl from you. Like, we were just 
sit there at our house smoking massive amounts of ganja and yeah. like you know like DJs would come by the booyah tri- mugs you sleep on our couch that house on Gardner I lived right across the street from Delicious Vinyl mm-hmm. that time it was on Gardner right behind Giant Rockets that was an epicenter of LA hip hop my house was there. <laughs> way more than Delicious Vinyl in that a was, way that was with Skate Master Tate right Skate Master Tate was my roommate who had been this artist signed to Island and this old school kind of DJ skater culture guy who had got into hip hop yeah. And he knew everybody from like Perry Farrell. Like I said, Muggs slept on the couch. Muggs got all the loops from Cypress Hill's first album out of Tate's record collection. Tate had an amazing like record collection, you know. So mm-hmm. we uh, uh, we just you know that house was just like a you know a lot went on there. You know what right. I mean? I was a street promoter. Tate sold things to smoke and was a <laughs> DJ collector, and it was just you know it yeah. was it was a really fun time. Yeah. You know, like I said, you know. All these cool groups are coming out, you know, out of L.A. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, so, and then you got into management. Right. I, um, House of Pain was my first artist. They, mm-hmm. um, they came to me and they said, you know, um, Cypress hadn't really blown up yet. They were just bubbling. Okay. They're like, no one's really paying attention to us over here. We need our own manager. And I said, okay, and I shopped their deal. In fact, Matt Jones is one of the people that kind of slept on it. I don't know. It maybe I'm Matt sure. maybe Matt tried to play it for higher ups, but a lot of labels slept on the House of Pain demo. And I mean, had, Motown, and, and Motown had, wasn't a place to No, bring but it had hip-hop. jump around on it, man. Yeah. I like think. any label. But I, you no, know, no, I understand. Motown at that time was like a white rapper. It just didn't make sense. They were like this bougie. I mean, black any label. rapper really didn't make sense no. there. But they any, had MC Brains, right? Right, but that any was, label should have signed. I mean, come on, yeah, jump around sure. on the demo. Mm-hmm. I mean, was, come on, man. That song is still. Yeah. How anybody could listen to that demo and, and, and pass on it. And I'm not saying Matt did that, but yeah. but a lot of ARs did. Well, we were talking about that in the car. Mm-hmm. Like, th- that. Um, Passing Me By was on the Far Sides demo that a yeah, lot of people slept on. For sure. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, that's what people do, right? Is they sleep on shit until it's. Uh, I won't even say obvious because those those are obvious, but until someone else is already doing it, mm-hmm. right, 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 right. Somebody like, else validates it, or and something. that's just right, true. Right. I mean, you know, with the electric car, mm. with you know, I'm sure somebody slept on the SUV when mm. someone was like, "We're going to make a, a, you know, just business in general." You're yeah, saying, you right? just you just you know, people are averse to new ideas, mm. Mm. and you know, in hindsight, they become obvious, right, mm-hmm. or you know, if you're if you're in it, you kind of got to be in it, yeah, to get it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Now, I, I, why I, the industry's run by a bunch of people that aren't in it deep enough to get it, like that's a different issue, right? Um, but so, uh, so I know you know the management thing went really well, and you you talked about some of the artists. Well, I made a lot of people a lot of money. I won't say it really went, went really well. For me, I mean, the, the end result, if you want to judge it on how much money I made, I mean, I, I, well, let's talk about that. So, okay. first of all, before we do that, yeah, yeah. Um, what was the first big paycheck? Uh, far side publishing deal. Okay. Went to Crenshaw Ford and got me a SUV, got a Ford Explorer. That's what I want to know. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. exactly what I did. Nice. Uh, yeah. That was my first check. Uh, Jody Gersh, Steve Prudhomme, Steve O uh-huh. made it happen. He was in the tape room. Yeah. And when, he, was- and when he got elevated, Big John came in the tape room, who yeah. now is like, yeah, he's like the president or John. Give me a job. Of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Steve O so, was one of the first dudes to pay me any attention. Good dude, great guy. Yeah, great guy. And you know, from Compton, DJ. You know, I mean, like to me, you know, the the, the real guys that pulled themselves up from those kind of things typically are like the realer mm. folks. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, you know, people you can come from anywhere. That's not what it's about. But yeah, you know. Um. So okay. Yeah, I get it. So, but you know, records are selling. Yeah. You know, I again, you know, I remember. Um, you know, I, you know, my perspective yeah. was, uh, you know, PMP was this huge thing, right? And you Very know, mismanaged, and you had, uh, you know, and the parties were legendary, right? You right. know, every you well, were happy, I, you were I, happy to get an invite to a Paul Stewart party, right? And some people are still mad at me because I didn't invite them to certain parties. Yeah, of where, course, they're pissed off. You, you know what? At, the, do, one, well, one thing I wanted to say, I thought you brought up earlier, is you, one of the keys to my successes, I think, was that. I got down differently than other people. Like I thought the parties were important. You know yeah. what I mean? And like I under, or maybe I understand the importance yeah. of things like that. Maybe mm-hmm. we should say, you know what I mean? And like I do some of my best networking, like running the streets at night and connecting right. people and everything, you know. But but you're not alone in that, right? Like Russell started as a party promoter. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know, oh yeah, a lot of uh, people. Yeah, Patrick yeah. Moxie told me that oh, early yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. You know, in his career. Yeah. You know, Patrick is now the king of 
dance music with ultra right what ultra records but yeah but you know two decades ago you know he had empire yeah he was gang stars original and he had manager. empire was a party in, right. in new york right? right and he was the one that put me up on no guest list mm. and he said you know russell would come through with models and he would see you know somebody else paying to get in and then russell would pay to get in mm. and you know heidi klum pays to get right. in and all that yeah la is weird i don't think la la people would pay it was a it's a weird market. Yeah, like for me, hard. well for me anyway. Like I have guys that are still friends of mine that are making money doing clubs and all right. that. You know, they went that route. I used it for politics, yeah, so sure. I never wanted to charge anybody. You for know, sure. it's like, hey, Rosie Perez and Queen Latifah are at my club, and like, right. you know, this gives me juice and da 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 da. So I was more like that, and then connecting people and stuff. I right. never really made the money. I wasn't a very good. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Now Mike Karen, when I did a, a club with him on a brief period, I made more money. Well, that's around with his little like uh, 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 Junior Lee or Cohen ass, you know, uh, uh, when he wasn't even old enough to get in the club. That's right. You know, uh, I did my uh, first party with Mike, and he was he couldn't he wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, you were part. And I'm talking about the party his, that you were yeah, partner yeah. with too. You know, yeah, you're was, talking about something else, right? Yeah, before yeah, yeah, that, right, we right, did right. A party. But together. we were all partners in that party, and there were right. nine of us, and I made more money doing that split nine ways yeah. than I had made. Yeah. But you yeah, know. and that was Mike's idea. I remember that, and and it was really down to the fact that business genius, right? Well, it was down to the fact that, A, you know, this takes some work. Mm. We probably could have put a little more work into it, made it last longer, mm. but separate story. But, you know, right. it takes some work, and we're not going to make any money doing it. And I also think, you know, people appreciate what they pay for, mm. right? And, and again, you know, this is a town where everybody likes to feel VIP. Sure. But if you saw- We let some people in free. We let some people in free, but it was a lot, you a know, lot the first paid. week, everybody got in free. Right. And then and after then, that, everybody paid. And more. then most yeah. people paid yeah, and we yeah. kept it on the low yeah, yeah. Who, who didn't pay. All I know is that Destiny's Child paid us to, perform. to do a listening party in our downstairs. And on the flyer, it says Destiny's Children. Oh, yeah. I got it. You talked about that. I got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, for Buster sure. Rhymes, EPMD performed for free. I mean, that's a case yep. of if you Cypress create paid. something amazing, mm-hmm. people will come to. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was, but it was also timing, too. I mean, you know, maybe we need that again right now. I don't know. But at that time, there was nowhere for people to perform. Right. So it was just kind of like we had the hot thing and yeah. people just, you know, they needed it. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, so I want to say, you know, uh, so f- from the outside perspective, you know, yeah. you were huge and what you were doing right. was huge. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that, you know, you always, uh, came off as real humble Thank you. to me and, and, you, you know, I, I don't think I fully grasped that, but, but I, you know, I would have conversations and your name would just come up constantly. Mm. And, um, there was some people I wouldn't say hating, but just kind of like, you know, sure. yeah, like maybe they didn't get into the party or right. they like, if you, you don't, know, you're not feeling maybe entitled to a piece of your success. You're not on if you ain't got haters. What's the new song? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, For like, sure. come on. If you don't, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I think there was some of that. Um, I noticed, you know, I was in my own career path and, you know, people, Steve Rifkin, mm-hmm. you know, told me I'm the next Paul Stewart. Mm. And, you know, and I, I don't think, first of all, I didn't, I mean, I took it as a compliment, but I didn't understand what it meant. Mm. Um, other than, you know, uh, white guy managing rappers, right? Like Smart white guy managing um, rappers in the... You know, yeah, yeah. devilishly handsome. Like I, <laughs> You know, I mean, I didn't know... Uh, <laughs> I love Josh. <laughs> uh, I didn't know how to how to really take that. Or, or like, I didn't understand mm. what it meant. And I, and I do, you know, but... Um, where was I going with that? But so... Uh, you know, it felt to me like you're, you know, you're on top of the world, mm. right? The big parties, the big house. Sure. Oh, know. I spent 10 grand on a birthday party. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I did silly stuff. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, what's funny. Um, I was really fortunate, you know, and I, I had a lot of success and I, and I made some good money and, um, you know, I never wanted to, I, I, you know, I just, I don't think that makes me a better person. You know, right. I mean, the guy that's out in helping poor people right, is a better person than me. You know what I mean? So it's like, sure. you know, like for me to have a big ego because I discovered some rappers or something like, come on, you know, like yeah. I, I, I guess I was raised better than that. You know, mm-hmm. thank you to my parents. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah you know, I just, I love, you know, I really respect humility. Yeah. And so I try, you know, my best, you know, to be that, you know, and, uh, you know, my career's had a lot of ups and downs too. So, you know, that's well, that's humbled me greatly. You know what I mean? So talk about that. So yeah. so you go from having, you know, yeah. dominating the charts, right? right At least right. from the West Coast. Sure. Um, and then that that stopped. Yeah. 
So dried up. What happened? <laughs> Uh, man, I lost the golden touch, I guess. I don't know. You know, um, I, partially I got burnt because I was making all these people famous. Like we're talking about, you know, I'm discovering all these artists, but I'm not really benefiting. Like I was with Coolio for five years. He was a great client. Right. When I met him, he lived in Nickerson Garden Projects in Watson. He fired me a month after he won a Grammy, you know, to hire his wife to replace me. So, mm -hmm. And he was my best client. You know, he lasted <laughs> five years. So, you know, I mean, I, right. I, that was a good one. But... You know, so I got tired of that scenario yeah. of making people rich and famous and I'm not getting my just due. Sure. So I kind of, you know, and the music supervision thing was much more civilized in some regards, you know what I mean? And I don't know, you know, I, I also think too that, you know, maybe I fell victim a little bit to like getting out of the things that made me find all the artists to begin with. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I was in the streets, you yeah. know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. after a while, it's like, like I, I look back on a couple of the artists that I signed on my last label deal with Loud after the Def Jam deal. And it was kind of like, you know, when I signed Montel Jordan, all my homies were like, this dude's a buster. This shit is whack. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't the kind of shit that we liked. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But then it was so big I guess I kind of like, I felt like then I was like trying to make things. Well, Instead and, of Franklin, and your name was in the song. Yeah, like he called nice. you out yeah, nice. <laughs> in the song. Right. Like. <laughs> right. But, but but my point was being like, you know, instead of like trying to go find something like the far side that's really dope or whatever, like, well, I can just take this good looking guy and we make some hip hop beats and we'll write some songs. For, you know, I kind of got, I don't know, just like right. thinking I was a star maker or something that I could just, you know, instead right. of, before I just found people that were dope, understood they were dope and that right. was my thing, you know. Yeah. So maybe I got caught up in that a little bit. You know, obviously the industry changed. I think I probably had some dope artists that got slept on because, you know, we weren't sound scanning or BDSing or whatever, too, when, when the industry changed to that. Because before it was just mm -hmm. like, listen to my demo. It's great. Mm -hmm. Sign me, you know. So when that changed, you know, I kind of wasn't really ready for that change. You know what I mean? So I moved more into music supervision and did other things and just kind of got out of that space. You know, mm -hmm. and like I said, I had been burned mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, I... I you know, Josh, I've, you know, I do a lot of things. I yeah. just cast a music video for mm -hmm. George Clinton, Ice Cube, and Kendrick Lamar. You know, uh, nice. you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be music supervising two amazing shows right now. John Singleton's uh, Snowfall on FX and Insecure at HBO. Mm -hmm. And um, another really cool show, uh, Born Again Virgins on TV One. So I'm doing three TV shows as a music supervisor right now. So I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm doing great stuff. And uh, you know, I think I might get back into discovering artists soon. I, I found a really talented R&B singer named Greg Hine that I'm working with that I just love. And nice. you know, yeah, you know, for me, it's just about if I find somebody I think is amazing. You know, but I think part of it was that I wasn't in the places to find the amazing people mm -hmm. anymore. I, sure. I I stopped being in the mm -hmm. streets as much as I was. Yeah, you're you hanging know? out with models and yeah. I'm in Studio City in the house right. with a stream going down. I got you know. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's one of the things. now I'm in Crenshaw, so you know right. I'm, ba I'm back. Yeah, I got I got my whole. No, I think that's back. one of the interesting <laughs> things, right? Is that um, you know, your your success is it, success is a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, like I said, I've always seen you as as, you know, as humble and, and mm -hmm. connected. But even then, it's hard to fight the trappings that come with success. Sure. Right. You know, the phone starts ringing, you know, interesting people start showing up at your door. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bottles get bigger and, the, right. you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. I wish I could have handled some stuff differently, but mostly it was more that I didn't take advantage, I feel, of some of the opportunities that were there for me when my shit was so on fire. Yeah. And then some of the people that I chose to put on, like excluding you, I regret. Like a lot of the people that I helped out. Because then when I, they came up, and then when my thing was right. falling down, they were like, yeah, whatever, we don't remember that you right. put us on. You know, it was a lot of that. Of you know, I was like, wow, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm not used to this. I'm not mm -hmm. built like this. I look right. out for my people. What's this about? You know what right. I mean? But um, so... Yeah, did you? I mean, were there? Were there? Uh... Oh, I could have been. I could be real bitter right now. I mean, there were so many people that that I helped out that you know didn't do nothing for me when when I needed it. So, so to what's speak, the, you know? so? Give me the inner game when okay. that's happening. Well, how does it make you feel? Yeah. You know, 
I was talking to my artist Greg the other day, and we we're cussing out these ANRs because we hate ANRs, you know. And I was telling him, man, like, you know, like save all that negative energy, man. Like, don't, you know what I mean, and everything. And like, you know, basically, I said, you know, when I was at, when Def Jam was suing me, and it was the most like, you know, screwed up thing to happen to a little guy who's nothing but a good guy, you know, right. getting screwed sure. by the big guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just this horrible thing. I remember one time Lior was just screaming at me at the top of my mind, I'm gonna ruin you or some shit or whatever. And I remember I hung up the phone and I was like, you know what, I feel sorry for these people. You know what I mean? Like, they're so mm -hmm. miserable. Like, right. yeah. this guy's so rich. Why does he wanna hurt right. me? Lizzie you know what I mean? Like, yeah. why, you know, like, and you know, they thought I was unloyal, which I understand, I'm a loyalty man. You know what I mean? So like, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to say I didn't make any mistakes that I was perfect or anything in the situation, but I don't mm -hmm. think I deserved the way it went down, you know? And so I just, I just had to like, that was how I kind of dealt with it. Like, you know what? I didn't get everything I deserved, but you know what? I could hold my head high. People like me. I don't need no security to run around town like all right. these other guys. I'm not getting extorted. You know right. what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, it like, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah. I could still come back. I still got my talents and my skills. Right. I'm not some bitter person. Even if I do, I'm not going to be trying to shit on other people. You know what I mean? It's like, I, you know, you just got to, and, and look, those hard knocks, man, it, it built character. Yeah. I mean, you said I was humble before. Man, you think I was humble before, man. You know what I mean? Like, you right. know, all those ups and downs build character. And I think they show you what's important. You know what I mean? Like, man, like I don't want to get all deep in here, but you know, the last times I talked to Mike Karen was sitting in his studio was when Chris Lighty passed, you know? Right. Everyone's calling everybody and all like, oh my God, and what's really important, let's talk to our friends. And you know, a week later we forgot it all. But you know, for that moment everyone's yeah. like, Oh my God, and what's important and you know, let's talk to people we knew from before and like let's make sure they're okay and this kind of a thing, you know what yeah. I mean? And so you know, and then the crazy thing with Shakir Stewart and everything. And like, so mm -hmm. when these kind of things happen, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, man, I really wish I'd had some of that success these other people had or whatever, but, you know, let's be happy what we got. Let's appreciate what we have. Let's, you know, yeah. there's more to life, you know? Right. Um, I'm so motivated to do creative things, and I want to have the financial freedom to do whatever I want, but, you know, I, I can't, some people sacrifice more than I'm willing to, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, I work like an insane person, you know what I mean? But, you know, I have to have another life. I can't, you know, I'll never get anywhere by stabbing people in the back. This is not my thing, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I got to do it my way, you know what I mean? And so uh, uh, I feel great about what I'm doing, and, and I'm on a roll right now. I'm booking all these great shows. I have interest from a, a very prominent investor in the book company. And so, you know, I'm like, you know, and you know, man, I've, <laughs> I've been plugging at that and trying for to sure. get that for quite a while. And yeah. so, yeah, man, I, I feel great, you know. Um, um, just really happy to, you know, be able to work on creative stuff and work for myself, Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Um, just to go back to something you say, you know, you mentioned putting me on. So as I was getting mm. started in management, you know, I think I had one, I had one deal signed. Okay. And um, and y you called me and said, you know, some of like I might have an artist for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and you basically gave me Dub C right to manage right, um, who had been. You know, he wasn't huge at the time, but he was a legend on the West Coast. He had been a hero of mine. Right. I didn't know that he was about to do West Side Connection at the right. time. In fact, I think they were just starting to talk about mm -hmm. it. I don't think it was a done deal. Right, right. Um, and you basically handed him over to me because uh, of some crazy shit he did. Yeah, we had a little incident with Dub. And, you know, um, I love Dub, man. And, you know, um, what happened is my roommate, who was a music producer, who had produced Gangster's Paradise... We were at my house and Dub came for a photo shoot and Dub had his unreleased album. And, you know, at that time it was just really like, you know, this is my unreleased album. Nobody can have it. You mm -hmm. know, pre-internet yeah, and all that yeah. kind of stuff too. So but yeah, really worried about leaks. Right, right, that. right. And um, so my roommate Doug was like, hey, play it in my tape deck. We can bump it more through the house. Unbeknownst to anybody, when when Doug put it in his tape deck, remember tapes, from tapes, he had a dual tape deck and he duped it. When he played it, oh shit! Right, and then the, you didn't know this. And then the next day, I, you I forgot. forgot. And then the next day, it was a two-day photo shoot. And then the next day, he pulls up, bumping the thing. I'm at the office. Dub C hears Doug pull up, bumping his unreleased album. He's at my house doing a photo shoot. He shuts the photo shoot down, comes to my office, 
with a lug wrench in his hand, a huge lug wrench, has crazy tunes, stands outside my door, and starts breaking shit with the lug wrench and screaming at me, you know? Yeah, I was thinking about you yeah. when I was watching yeah. that scene in Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> oh, oh, with the Brian Turner? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, and the crazy thing was, I had no idea what he was upset about. Right. I mean, for me, it's like Tuesday morning. Right, I'm right, just right. sitting here like, everything's normal. And now, all of a sudden, my homie, Dub, is in my office with a lug wrench, like, breaking shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um... You know, um, we resolved it, obviously, um, without anybody getting hurt or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, in fact, that was probably, like I said, I've had, I never had problems like that with artists. Right. You know, that was one of the, one of the few, of the only really kind of thing like For that. Sure. And, you know, after the next day, Dub was really sorry and he apologized and he, he said, you know, I want to still work with you and everything. And, you know, I was a little... I was a little shook or whatever from it. And I was like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. But, you know, I got this great guy for you. And uh, Josh Levine, you know, yeah. he's, he's great. He's like well, a junior version cool of me. me. What? I said it worked out cool for me. Yeah. And, and, and look, you were the only guy that I could refer him to. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, there was nobody else that could do a good job. That You know what I mean? There weren't any people in that place. You know, like I said, there's such a lack of good talent representation in this industry, in the hip-hop business, and you yeah. know, especially, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and it, it's great, man. You've returned the favor 10 Fold, well, unfold, that was a big so. deal for me. It was yeah, a huge, yeah. you know, yeah. that was probably my biggest success, you know, as a manager. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's funny, I, at the time. I'm no, like, but wait, can I just say something? Josh is such a G because you know I told him the story. Yeah. You know, right? Of course, he knew what happened. He took on WC anyway. And Dub's a great guy, you know what I mean? And so we had always been friends before. We're still friends, you know right. what I mean? And so uh, uh, we never stopped being friends. You know, I just. I think I felt I didn't, you know, yeah, I, I didn't it. need to manage them. I had so right. many clients at that point. Like, well, that's the thing. I mean, I was managing Coolio and the Far Side and Lighter Shader sure. Brown. I had a bunch of guys that were making me a lot more money than him. Yeah, you know, and I, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't feel like I needed anything that was a headache. You no, know, that's like, understandable. Right, right. You know, but me, I give you so much props for for, for not being scared. You know, I'm, I'm sure, like you, like, like it didn't occur to me to be scared. Right. And that's gotten me right. a lot of what I've gotten in life. Yeah. It's just not realizing that I was supposed to be scared in that moment. <laughs> um, and we, you know, it's funny at the time, I mean, I was just, I was, like I said, I was pretty much just starting out. I was living with my grandparents. Right. And I was working, you know, they had a, they had a three bedroom house and they gave me two bedrooms. I lived in one and the other was my office. Mm. I bought like a real desk and I like set it up as my office and right. I had an artist coming through. Right, right. You know, and uh, that work from home thing was, you know, that's not new. That's not a like internet phenomenon. Like we've right. been doing that sure forever. And and him and Tunes came over, and we like worked out a deal in ten minutes. You know, we we had met before. I had interviewed right. him for, right. for oh a, when you were for an article. Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wrote the herb piece on 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 the curb server record, mm. and um, so we you know we knew each other not well, but we had met a little bit. But I was a fan. Right. You know, from from right. pay I'm dues. sure he appreciated that. Yeah, from pay dues. Like sure. I loved, you know, everything that he was about. Yeah. And um but I had it but but we did have a conversation. I said, Look, I, I know what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here with my grandparents. Like, you know I can't have that here. Well I was like, Yeah, I'll yeah, do yeah. everything I can for you. Yeah, yeah. Like you just you gotta see, tell me that that's not coming to my grandparents' house. Right. And he was like, Yeah, that, you know, it was a one time thing, I'm yeah. done. Like Yeah, he's not I that get kind it. of dude. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, there was definitely artists that I might have been scared of, you know, I had, you know, that were just wild. Uh, you know, but like I said, then, you know, Dub C, like, was a professional. Oh, like, yeah. All day. Yeah. You know no, I mean? no. Like, it, we never had a moment where I had to, like. I, I, I was, I was, con uh, what's the word? Um, like, I was, um, I couldn't decide if yeah, I was. I get it. Conflicted. I was conflicted. Thank you. If, because I, I was gonna keep him. Right. You know what I mean? Because it was, you know, I didn't think he would ever do anything like that again yeah, or anything. Sure. But you know. Yeah, well, I'm glad you didn't. Yeah. No. No. You know, <laughs> it, it, was, it was great. You know, I was, I was a fan of yours, and um, it, it was nice to be able to, you know, do something for somebody that appreciated it. You know what I mean? And you probably did a much better job with his career than we would have been able to do because we were, oh, you, no. you know, you were able to focus on it more when we had mm -hmm. bigger right. clients yeah, and we were just sure. kind of like, but you know, the crazy thing is Dub knew me forever because, right. you know, when Muggs and Aladdin were roommates, 
uh, when Muggs was forming Cypress Hill, I lived in these little ghetto apartments in the same complex that Muggs lived in and like Prince Whipper Whip lived in there. Oh, it wow. was um, King's Normandy and Sunset. It was hood over there. Yeah, it, was it was like strippers, heavy metalers, and rappers in that building. It was mm-hmm. like crazy. But um, So I knew Dub from then because that's when low profile was happening. Right. And I knew Doug Young as manager. I knew, you know, it was a really small circle. Mm-hmm. And then when Coolio, when I started working for, when Coolio decided he wanted me to manage him, that's when I worked for Street Knowledge for Ice Cube. And Dub was Ice Cube's hype man. Right. So he would always come to Street Knowledge. He'd see me there. That's how I met Coolio. Coolio was Dub's hype man for right. his shows. And then, you know, Coolio was like, you're my manager, you know. So I had this, Dub had seen me come up from like a young kid to like, all, like you know what I mean? So he yeah. was kind of always like, I think I need this dude on my team. But it was mm-hmm. kind of a conflict because I was Coolio's man. It was almost like, you know, sure. they were boys, but it was kind of like, maybe I need my own, you know, type of thing or something, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny you say that, like, um, I always try to explain to people that, you know, back then, you know, it was a really small community. Right. And, you know, everybody kind of knew everybody. Like, people always ask me, like, oh, how do you know, you know, so-and-so? I was sure. like, well, just because he was there. We were right. both there. Right. And you were there every night. You know what I mean? And and I felt like at that time, uh, we just assumed that, like, this thing was going to get bigger and bigger forever. Right, that's why I bought the house in Studio City with the stream going on it that I had to sell five years later because my income dropped. <laughs> yeah, right, like right, that. Right. But also just, I just mean that right, like- that's because I was silly. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but that's a, that's a totally normal reaction. It right. may be the wrong one, right. but it's totally right. understandable. Yeah. Right, right. No, but I guess I'm saying that like, you know, if, I don't know if that, I don't feel like that still exists in the music business. Mm. Like this sense of like, there's no stopping us. Right, right. You know, you're seeing, I mean, we were watching Puffy real time become Puffy. Right. I saw him passing from, out flyers. Exactly. At, 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 the, at the Jack the Rapper. Exactly. Yeah, sure. And, you know, not everyone was that big, but that, but that no, was like right. a, that was like a thing that could actually happen. I mean, I remember Dame Dash came to L.A. and was like, my shit was popping. And he was right. like trying to get on and everything. So when yeah. he popped, he was always kind of like, yeah. I remember you were doing it. You know what right. I mean? Gave me a little love, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that just seemed, I, you know, I wonder where that exists today. Tech, I don't feel like in it happened world? In, maybe in the tech world. I just read an article about these kids that are, like, dropping out of high school, moving into these mm. apartments, living, like, six on a floor, and just coding, mm-hmm. you know, nonstop, you know, because they think they're going to be the next tech billionaire. Well, well, you know, I think there's a, I, I don't, you know, I think there's a really exciting thing going on in the music industry right now because, you know, the kind of like, you don't have to sign to a major label anymore right? Mm-hmm. and all that. And you can really like, you know, some of the monopolies that the majors control are gone. Like if you make a great record and you know what I mean? And it's yeah. really great. That thing can be on the radio, take off, you know, look at Fetty Wap. Yeah. Like, <sighs> If that doesn't inspire you, come on, man. That dude came out of nowhere. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, like, yeah. the record was just so good. People just liked it. So, I mean, this is my opinion anyway, that people liked it so much. It was just undeniable. It's not like he – it wasn't because of his amazing video. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure wasn't his amazing video. Sure. You know what I mean? It wasn't like – you know, so yeah. I just think, you know, it's a good time in music. And, and, and I'm actually really excited about all the music that's coming out right now. And – um that's going on and, and the, some of the changes in the music industry like yeah no the way it was before you know we do get this big check from the major and you know and that's whole kind of change for the mm-hmm. most part but i do think um uh, it's a more exciting time because you know creatively you can do what you want as a lot of these independent artists have their own little niche they might right. not be huge but they can make a living doing their art mm-hmm. and do what they want yeah and then if they're really good it'll grow and maybe it'll pop maybe they'll have yeah. that record and they'll pop you never know you know what i mean so um I like what happened in the music industry because, you know, I, I hate major labels and their whole philosophy and their attitude and the way they do business and the way they treat artists and their approach and everything. And so I'd love to see them all gone if possible. You know what I mean? So I think that the changes have been, you know, while it's been hard on the industry and that there's not as much of the money flowing and stuff because people don't buy music anymore, it's changed the game and, and kind of opened it up for some artists and things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So – you know, as you're going through this sort of, uh, you know, I would call it a reinvention, but it, you know, it seems like to some extent an evolution, right? Like, okay. you know, I know you mentioned you're, you're doing work with John Singleton now, right? you know, you worked with him, you know, 20 years ago, way Texas, back. Whenever. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so was there like, how conscious was that process? How conscious were you in that process that like, okay, I'm, 
I'm switching lanes. Well, you know, uh, I went through some fairly lean years. I mean, I never stopped sure. music. You know, I was bugging you for marketing work and stuff. You know, I, 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 I never stopped music supervising, but sometimes I wasn't making that much money doing it, and mm-hmm. I had to do other hustles and stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, um, you know, it was it was some time. You know, last couple years up until more recently where I was trying to figure stuff out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just like, what can I do to make it stick? You know, I was getting a little frustrated at some points because I felt like I have so much talent and I've done all this great stuff and, you know, where are the opportunity? I'm willing to work hard. Where You know, where are the opportunity? What can I do? You know, because it's also a guy like me at my age is kind of like, what are you, what are you going to do now? Right. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and, like, it, I remember, like, when, when, when Sean Karazov passed away, uh, a lot of people were saying, you know, guys like him, their skill set is no longer needed. Some of the people in the music industry, ah, or they, that's it. <laughs> or they feel it's yeah, no longer needed. For sure. The industry feels it's not. Let's not say it's actually not longer, but the industry has decided they don't need it anymore, which is one of the reasons they're not doing as well as they were. I think you know what yeah. I mean. So you know, it, it can be hard. You know what I mean. And so you know, I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid. I mean, I I don't know any other way to make a living. And I wasn't like this cutthroat, smart business guy. I just mm-hmm. happened to be talented and hardworking. And smart enough to kind of pick up on my mistakes as I went, you yeah. know what I mean. So it's definitely been an evolution for me, you know. And and basically, it was just like I, I credit the success I'm having right now to just like you know, uh, uh, man, R.I.P. to my dad and that hard work aesthetic mm-hmm. ethic that he installed in me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you know, just grinding. Like because there have been a lot of times where it's just like you know. Things aren't happening for me, and I get frustrated. So all I can do is just work and try to create new opportunities. And sometimes those, you know, those little things don't happen for a long time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But you know, I'm setting these little traps and all around, and eventually, sometimes mm-hmm. they pay off. You know, mm-hmm. down the road and stuff. And so, you know, it, it's, and you know, for me, you know, I'm like, I'm just like a big kid. I've never been very responsible with my money. You know, luckily, I'm good at making it. You know what right. I mean? And stuff like yeah. that. But you know, I'm sure. not. I'm not that person. You know, and so uh, I have to be good at making a lot of money. Because I'm gonna run through it. That's right, right, and have fun doing it. But you know, yeah, yeah. So. I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, was there a, ever a time when you when you just were like ready to give up? Yeah, I mean, a couple. You know, I would say like kind of my current like run of having more success has kind of started in the last year or so, and in a couple years prior to that, I mean, I would. I, but but what can I do though? Right. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know. Go work at Amoeba or something. I mean, yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, what yeah. what's giving up for me? Yeah. Like, what kind of what can I do? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, you know, I took a job at Puma doing music marketing, which was mm-hmm. cool. I, you know, you know, so I've done some like marketing kind of thing that was really corporate for me. You know, and was tough. Uh, but you know, I, I mean, but who, even even uh, no, I get it. I mean, but who's gonna hire? Like, I, you know, they look at me. You're old. You know, there's these young kids. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know. Uh, I'm pretty, you know, tech savvy, but still, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, certain. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how, I don't feel very employable. All I can do is keep hustling and come up with new kind of like creative, you know what right. I mean, things and hope that, you know, uh, I, you know, what's really great is like, you know, this, this HBO thing I'm doing is just such an amazing thing, man. It's with this woman, Issa Rae, who uh, had this web series, uh, Misadventures of an Awkward Black Girl. And mm-hmm. so she created her own platform, you know, you know like there, you know, there's so little quality like work for black actresses out there you know what i mean and 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 so you know she just creates her own platform and you know does several of these until several web series until one hits and she's at hbo with it you know what Mm -hmm. i mean and so you know i'm fortunate enough to meet her because my friend is the showrun on the show and it's like my whole life has prepared me now i'm ready you know like i meet with the hbo and like great we oh you've done all this you're great you know what i mean i meet with her like wow you've done all this you know what i mean it's like you know so it's like so it's kind of some of the stuff, it also too, some of the things I did are coming are more in vogue now than sure. they were shortly after I did them. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, the Far Side, wow, that's really cool. You know what I mean? Like some of the things that I did mm-hmm. were really cool at the time, and then laughter. It's like, well, you don't got anything on the chart this week, and now there's all this. There's a little bit more nostalgia for some some of that era stuff. And of right. course, I'm still doing, yeah, you know, sure. new current. You know, like oh, like she was really impressed I had done Dear White People. You know, which was was uh-huh. great, and we had no money uh, for the music, and so she was really impressed with that. And so you know, so it was. It was great, you know. So, you know, sometimes the good guys get lucky, you know. We, we keep grinding, and, 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 and the good stuff we did kind of pays off, you know. Yeah. So, What about, uh, I think, you know, we did a we did a project together for um, for Puffy, the, that cologne. Sean John. 
Yeah. Right. The Shanjan cologne. Right. I'm sure it smelled great. Uh, <laughs> smell like Puffy. Right. That's what, that was the tagline. No, it was cool. But, um, <laughs> but you said something to me, you know, just at that time we were talking and you said, you know, that you felt like your lane, what you were really good at and, and what you enjoyed was being around creative people and helping them mm. do what they do, what they do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I thought that was a really great sort of insight into mm. yourself. And I, you know, I don't know that that's, I mean, it kind of sounds obvious in retrospect, but I think when you're in it, sometimes that's harder to see. It's like, I make records or I make hits or I turn, you know, I make stars or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. People tell themselves mm -hmm. about who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, how is that, uh, you know, kind of realizing that then like, how does that affect your decisions going forward? Because then, like you said, you were at Puma, right. which I think on the surface- Sounds great. It's a dope job. Right. You know, music marketing for, sure. you know, a cool shoe brand. Like, yeah. that's a good job. Um, but but that's very different than, you know, what you describe as your passion. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I figured out, and it took me a long time to figure it out, what I enjoy, one of the things I enjoy most in life is helping creative people reach their vision, right? So, you know, now that I have the book company, you know, like I'm meeting artists, painters, oh, we could do a book of your work. Like, oh yeah. my God, a book of my work. It's their minds blown. They're so happy. You know, that makes me feel amazing. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, the same way I could meet a talented artist. Oh, wow, you're great. Hey, I could put you in the studio here. I got this producer or whatever. You know what I mean? So just kind of helping creative people reach their, their goals or their visions is like really rewarding. Like, you know, I want to make a lot of money doing it, but the reward that the feeling that you get from that is pretty priceless. You know yeah. what I mean? And so, and it's just, it's, it's just, that's what I enjoy doing, you know, and I'm, I'm good at it. You know what I mean? It's like, I walk in this world in between the creative and the business, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not either in mm -hmm. a weird way. Like, you know, I'm not the super duper, I'm no Mike Karen, you know what I mean? I wasn't in high school, like setting up things where people, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, my brain doesn't work like that, but, I, but you know, but I'm more business than all the artists that I do, the, the sure. non-business people. So I'm like in the middle and I understand where they're coming from, understand where the business people. So I kind of help, I, I can help mix those worlds. You know yeah. what I mean? It, whatever it is, you know, yeah. whatever kind of creative, uh, thing they do you know what I mean and so uh yeah that's really rewarding and and that's what I want to be doing and you know with the book company we did a uh, there was a thing like there was a, a teacher that uh, teaches at Crenshaw uh, art department art school but she teaches art at Crenshaw High yeah. and so uh one thing that we're working on is to try to do a book of the students artwork and have them just make it for them so they could sell it to raise money for the department you know what I mean so you know really want to try to do, mm -hmm. give back um, I mean I I've made a living off of working with talented people out of inner cities, basically. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I want to give back. I also just think that's where all the talent comes from. It always comes, you know, like, you know, yeah. you're hungrier. You know what I mean? Like, I, remember I, have this, I used to work with this really talented artist from Beverly Hills, you know. He never really made it. I mean, he didn't have the right. hunger, I don't think. He was so talented, you know what I mean? But it's like, you know, yeah. all the creativity to me always comes from the streets because it's like you have less to work with, you're right. forced to be creative, you know, yeah. it, ingenuity, the resource, whatever that expression is, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... You know, I, I want to give back. I want to be involved. It, it's what I enjoy, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to make some people really rich doing it. And in the process, I'll, I'll be able to reach my financial goals, you know, mm -hmm. on my terms and without, you know, stabbing people. Or... Have you had mentors that have that have helped you along the way? <sighs> Tons. Um, but a lack of like one great one. too. I didn't have yeah. that. Like a lot of people had that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I learned a lot from a lot of different people. I learned a lot from Leo Cohen before he got mad at me. Um, what was a, what's what stands out as something he taught you? And he was more his uh, uh, approach. It was just more that like bull, like I'm not stopping, yeah. like you know, you know what I mean. Like I hadn't quite been, I, you know, Dolores Robinson, uh, Matt Robinson's mom. When I worked with Matt, we shared office with her, and she was managing like Wesley Snipes and stuff like that. And you know, a black woman in Hollywood, she was cussing motherfuckers out. You know what I mean? Like she was not <laughs> taking no shit. You know, she had yeah. to be. I feel like that. And you know, but just seeing her interact with people and like the Hollywood thing, like her, you know, like I said, Leo, Matt Robinson, in a different way because he was so creative and 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 you know, like that. He, in fact, and Matt gave me my first. I feel like. Really gave me my first break because he helped me start DJing. He he hired me to DJ at some clubs where like you know they were like important industry people, celebs and everything, and that helped me get to know people and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. one time Tate didn't show up, and he hired me is what happened. You know, that's funny. And um, 
you know, so from him and then Orlando again gave me my first job at Delicious Final, so I'm forever in his debt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, that was my first actual job. You know, so you know the guy at Arista, Dean Porter, who was my boss. You know, I, I just picked up from people along the way. You know, uh, I wish I had had that like you know uh, just amazing one maybe that could have because I made so many mistakes. Because I, you know what of I course. mean. Tony Abner, my my, my uh, uh, mm -hmm. first attorney. You know, my second attorney after I lost my first client because I didn't have the pay contract signed. You know, sure. taught me so much. You know what I mean. And so you know, um, yeah. But I want to be that for other people. You know, so, so young yeah, so people it, hit me up. You know, I, I, my last one of my last interns just got hired at Universal to do what we do in reverse, where we call him as music supervisors to ask for quotes, and he gives us the quotes. Yeah. Uh, so you know, he's got a career. You know, he worked very hard. I put him through the fire, but you know, now he's got a great job, benefits. Well, career, you put a lot you know. of people in the game. Oh yes, quite a Absolutely. few. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I felt so, and when, when someone comes to you, you know, a student or young person, yeah, like what's the, you know, what's the knowledge you, you drop on them? Well, hopefully whatever they need, you know, I mean, because every, you know, where, the, what, what are they trying to do or, you know, but I mean, I just try to share my experiences and, you know, like I said that, like, you know, that book you gave me, man, whoa, that was motivating, man. What was the title of it? Uh, the Obstacle is the Way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I recommend everyone get that book. I love man. that book. Yeah. I mean, one thing about that book and, you know, I was going through some motivational problems with the book company at that time because I've been doing it for so long. I hadn't been able to turn the corner. I remember there was one thing in the book there was like, have you knocked on every door? Have you... And it's like, I know so many people in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I haven't even come close to knocking on every door. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know so many people, you know, it's right. like, you know, and yeah, a lot of people I thought maybe what didn't, and said, but you know, hey, you gotta, you know, hey, cause that one, you know what I mean? Like, right. you know, I tell people a lot, you know, when, when Steve Rifkin gave me the big deal with Loud Records, like, I never thought Steve would give me that deal. Remember, I was still mad at him for paying us 50 bucks a record to do the street promotion almost. Sure. Like, I mean, you know, it wasn't like, you know, I had a lot of respect for Steve, but we weren't close. Right. And I never thought, you know, so is it? You never know. Yeah. You know, that's why you always, you know, and you never know where someone's going to end up. You know, and I firmly believe that. Like, you know, I've seen people like come from nowhere. You know, so, and and like I said, just like you say, my aesthetic. Like, I don't think because you do this that you know we all pull our pants legs up one like at the time. And I respect people that are like you know friendly and humble. To everybody, you know, that's something I really respect. You know, mm -hmm. like like. I got like look Quincy Jones. Like after I met yeah. Quincy Jones, like you can be this famous, this rich, and this nice and down to earth. Anybody can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you know, right. it should yeah. be. We just had QD three on the show, so oh. we, heard, we heard a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Good, Good dude. Guy. Yeah. 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 I've worked with QD three a lot. I'm and, sure. Yeah, we have a long, long history. Yeah. 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 It's funny. I asked him uh, not to give away the yeah. interview, but yeah, you know, I asked him when did you realize your father was Quincy Jones? Yeah. Right, because he told me he went to he went to uh, he didn't know right away. Right. Well, right. he went. He said right. he went to he was with his dad when he met Michael Jackson, but he was five years old. Mm. He didn't know who Michael Jackson was. You know what I mean? Like, wow. you know, right? right? You don't right, 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 realize. Right. No, that, right, right, right. And he said to some extent he's still discovering that. Like, wow, right? You know, right? It's funny. It's just all your perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's you, do you have a favorite DJ? Mark Ronson. Probably. Really? Yeah. What? Give us some more that open story. format, you yeah. know, just being able to play anything. I mean, I remember seeing like guys like Clark Kent kill it at parties in New York too, you know, because they would go from like soul, house, hip hop, reggae, you know, just like playing everything, you know what I mean? Like, and 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 those like ups and downs of the night, you know. I mean, um, you know, locally, you know, Adam Twelve and Tendaji are good DJs. I mean, um, you know, um, I yeah. I love people that can um, mix old and new. One thing I like about Mark is like he's got that flavor of like what's cool and hip, but like you know, like I heard him throw like you know like a Cash Money record on top of some other, you know, like he's not so like he mm -hmm. understands what's new and cool and happening in a way to mix it in with like all these classic great records. Uh, that guy Cassidy's really good, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, um, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. I nice. like you know, I just I have such broad taste in music, you know, sure. and I love guys that are creative. You know, Z Trip, oh Z Trip, yeah. You know, and yeah. all his new Mark, oof, uh -huh. and he's such a nice guy too, good guy. Yeah, he's a, he's been on the show. Oh man, man, what a good dude, man! Shout out Definitely. to DJ Newmark, you know. Yeah. Um. What about? Uh, I love guys like that that have reverence. You know, just it, DJ Newmark treats me with so much respect because of some of the groups I discovered and everything like that. I just think it's nice. You know, I would do that in return, but yeah. I don't get that for most cats. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's just it's it's nice. I really sure. appreciate guys like that. Yeah. Because I feel like that about him, you know. What about, you know, you've had so many, uh, you know, big clubs, big club mm -hmm. nights. Does one stand out? 
a performance or a night. I remember that night we did our club and like too short and Ice Cube couldn't get in. It was That's so right. packed. Yeah, a shack couldn't get in or That's something right. like that. All, all, all those guys couldn't get it because we were at capacity. Yeah. Uh, when I did that club Brass, I remember we had a night where like Jamalski and Queen Latifah were like on the mic busting and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I think I was there. Yeah, yeah, there's a really cool picture. You know, that. But um, I don't know, man. People tell me, you remember you were DJing at that Quincy Jones party? I was like, huh? I don't, know. I don't even remember a lot of stuff. Right. Too much kids. Leave the blunts alone. <laughs> Too many blunts. Um, but um, yeah, I don't remember a lot of stuff. Um, but um, hopefully the best is still coming. For sure. I'm ready to throw some big over the edge books parties and, yeah. and get my, you know, I'm going to show these cats out here how to do it. Definitely. You know what I mean? And, and, and like, you know, my thing is like, I love all the old school and this and everything. I have a lot of reverence for it and everything, but I love youth and what's going on right now. And I just don't, I just, I, I just hate that mentality of like, oh man, what we did was great and this stuff sucks. Right. I hate that. Yeah. I'm listening to all new music. Do you think that's just an age thing or is there more to it than that? I think it's always easy to be nostalgic for what was hot when you were young and mm -hmm. yeah. looking good and young girls are looking at you or whatever, you know, all that fun stuff. But no, nah, you know, I think it's that most people just, like, you know, I think all a and should have had to been DJs. For, mm. Like, mm. I DJed for years, and, like, that's training. Like, like you right. learn what makes people, what people want, and it's pressure. Like, right. you know, all night, record after record, you got to keep it going. It ain't just like right. you play one record, oh, okay, that word, you know. <laughs> Next, that, you got to keep it going, you know. And so I, I think that kind of really honed mm -hmm. DJing for so long. It really honed my understanding of what people like in music right. a lot sure. and what makes people, you know, gravitate towards certain things, you know. And um, you so, think so I think I'm in touch. I just feel like me personally, like I'm in touch with what's going on right now. So I get it and understand. Some people, I just don't think they're as immer they're not as immersed in it or as real with it. Or they would, you know, they had their little air and they, that was what they were about, and they get it, you know. Right, that's cool. Yeah, but I and everybody's you, different, you know. Sure. Yeah, but you mentioned that like DJing and and obviously the craft of DJing is changing. Oh yeah, dramatically, right? Yeah, and I think. You know, I mean, we've had a lot of DJs on this show, and and the the guys are like, there's a common theme, yeah. Kind of a, what you just said. It's like a, a lot of it is what you get back from the crowd, right? Right, and it's learning to read a room and learning to pay attention, right? To even the different, you know, Adam Twelve talked about, you know, you got the the punkers over here uh -huh. and the hip hop kid, the breakers that want to hear this song, and the girls that so want to hear that song. So how can you play the stuff that's going to make them all? Or, how do you how do you orchestrate? Or you build a set around that, right, right, to, right so right. that everybody gets theirs. Right, right. And I think, um, you know, there have always been good DJs and bad DJs. Sure. I think you know technology has, helps the good DJs be better. Yeah, and also helps the bad DJs be better. That's true. Right, like that's true. No, that's um, definitely true. You don't have to train wreck anymore because you can't mix, right? You can. That's true. There's a solution for that. Not necessarily a bad thing. No, no. Well, I mean, I there's nothing I hate more than button pusher DJs and that whole culture, right? But you know, I, I'm gonna tell you a funny thing too, and all the DJs that know me know this. I, you know, I DJ like. I DJed the Fresh Prince TV show for the studio audience. I did mm -hmm. Will Smith's first wedding. I used to do Wesley Snipes parties. I did stuff like that, Club Brass, which was cutting edge cool. I yeah. did like Jamaica House. I DJed a lot of big stuff, but technically I was pretty horrible as a DJ. I wasn't good, Josh. I was, I, you know what? But I was so good at knowing what people wanted to hear. Right. And I was just proficient enough that I made it work. You're talking about the actual blending. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was shitty. Yeah. My wife, my ex-wife, when she started DJing, she jumped on the wheels and was better than me like in a week. That right. You know, like almost immediately there. But I, and, and, and part of it I think is what like, I worked, I had to work so hard at the other because I wasn't blessed. Right. That's what made me so good at understanding what people wanted, you know. But so it's like, you know, the technical part is important, but like knowing what people want to hear mm -hmm. is ultimately the most important. And that's why I would out DJ and get paid and hired around these DJs that were way technically better than me when mm -hmm. I was DJing. Right. You know what I mean? And people would hire me because the most people don't care. They want to hear what they want to hear. You know, as long as you can, you know. And, it, it, you know, that's why when I got be uh, more money, I stopped DJing and I just hired good DJs because right. I knew what a good DJ was. Right. Yeah. It wasn't me. But, you know, I had my thing mm -hmm. and I was better than most of these cats because I know what people want to hear, right. mm -hmm. you know. And so, so I have a much different perspective, you know. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Um, I just wonder, you know, how much, how easy it is for, you know, we talk about 
you know, the, the way the culture is today, like yeah. how easy it is to stay tapped into that. Well, I, you just need to hang out with young people. Yeah, you yeah. just you, you just you gotta you gotta have broad circles, you know. Yeah. It's like we're all in this ageism thing in this country. You know what I mean? It's like you know you need to have you know old friends that can teach you the old school stuff and young people to put you up on what's something right now. I mean, I've been listening to nothing but like new ratchet stuff right now. I love it, man. Like you know, I you know what what stands out? Oh man, I'm, my man, bad luck out of Watts. Big shout out to him. Um, you know, problems, YG, all the LA stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. Migos, Pee Wee Longway, the, the the Southern stuff, you know. I mean, just you know, um, a lot, you know. And I love all this like down tempo, electronica, really groovy stuff, like a Doja Cat type of, you know. There's all this like groovy yeah. stuff coming out, you know what I mean? Um, you know, something like where the down tempo electronica meets the R and B, mm -hmm. you know, it's just really cool stuff happening in that in that genre. All these uh -huh. uh, unknown bands, uh, SoundCloud stuff, you know. Um, and um, yeah, I'm listening to. Um, I mean, I love Ray Strumming. I mean, like, you know, I'm really into. Um, I don't like everything. I don't, you know, like I'm not a Nicki Minaj fan. There's certain things I don't like, but I, sure. but a lot of the new music, I'm, you know, like I said, I, I love Ray Strumming. I think those guys are geniuses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ty Dollar Sign, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Future. You know, mm -hmm. really digging a lot of the new music. You know, and of course, I I have reverence and love. I mean, I, I'm a music head. I like Bob Marley, Miles Davis. I mean, I have very sophisticated taste all the way to the extreme other end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's all just self-expression, right? Yeah. I well, I mean, I, I, I just think, you know, it's like each generation kind of has their thing, right? You know, like we had our thing and it was really cool. And, you know, what's going on right now, like, I, I just like, Travis Scott, this dude, uh, Post Malone, this kind of like singing rap thing that's going on right now, and just a lot of the musicality and like the music, like the production and everything. Like you know, it's it's uh it's exciting. I mean, like you know, the, the sample driven stuff that from the golden era is great, but you know, it's just a different right. You know, a different thing. Yeah, for you know? sure. I you know, for me, it's like when I I'm the kind of person like when I I was always a reggae fan when I went to Kingston and went to like a real dance in Kingston it was like man you know I became even just a more hardcore reggae fan when I went somewhere and heard him playing like Calypso at a mm -hmm. dance you see mm -hmm. like when you go to when you go to uh, 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 Brazil and, and you see the uh, sambas at, at the dance yeah. school and everything you get into it like that's how I am when yeah. I'm in the culture and I see the thing yeah. if it's real like when, the first time I went to the south I wasn't into that kind of music then I right. went to a club and I seen Girls dancing on top of tables, every freaking this out. Wow, it's funny. You this know, is fun. This is hot. You know, right? For sure. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it's funny. You know, we love to travel. My wife and I, right. we go all all over the world, and we have t two things that we have to do everywhere we go. We go to a club, mm -hmm. and we go to a grocery store. Mm. And you know, I've been to grocery stores in little towns in China, right, right, and right. whatever. But you know, because you. You really see how people live. Mm -hmm. Wow! And you, in the, you know, in the club, you see how people dance, how they get yeah, down, right? And yeah. it's, and it's a totally, you know, like you said, it it, it completely. I mean, going to a Sama school in right. Rio, right? Right, like that is not the same as listening to, to a, a Bossa Samba Nova record. No, at home, no, no. You know no. what I mean? No, not at all. Um, no, you experience, you yeah. feel when you in the. You know what I mean? And you, like sometimes, and, and well, for me, like that'll make me a fan after. Yeah. Right. So then after I'm listening to Samba and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I get it. Once yeah. you're in that environment right. where people are like, and it's usually dance music, yep. and it's usually something that people are partying off of. You know, right. I mean, when I went to Dominican, like talk about this ageism thing. You got old people and young kids partying, dancing off their music and everything. You know, yeah. and it's like I thought I knew a lot about Latin music, man. Like, there's so many different styles. Sure. It's it's you know, absolutely. It's really amazing. You know, it's yeah. a big world. You know, and it's really exciting. I, I I just I love traveling and hearing different what people are into culturally. And and now what's great is like the internet. Like I remember when we were traveling in South America and the the the. The Korean guy with the huge hit uh, was out. Oh, sorry. Right, and they were covering it in all the different languages. Like yeah. we're in we're in Paraguay, and we're hearing like the Spanish version or whatever. Like you know, it was That's just tough. like yeah, it's just like the way things travel off the internet now. I think you know, it's the the cultures. It's a smaller world now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, you go places they got Wi Fi, and all of a sudden they're listening to like something you were listening to that came out of your town and you're cr halfway across the world. Yeah. And like this is weird. This is crazy. It's it cool. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I know we're probably running out of sure. time. Um, but, but so how is a good book like a good record? 
Well, you know, at the end of the day, we're finding a creative talent and we're taking their talent and, 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 and exposing it to the world, right? So whether it's a song or, you know, some artwork in a book or writing in a book or something like that, you know, it's a creative piece of art that somebody created that, that I believe in that I'm helping share with the world. So mm -hmm. if it's a song I'm trying to get people to listen to or if it's a book I'm trying to get people to read it. It's a creative do you, project. Do you think that, that ex you just talked about your experience as a DJ and what that does right. to uh, the process of finding music. Right. How do you apply that to finding books and authors? Well, you know, I think um, in, in, in kind of hopefully in the way that I understand what makes people move with music, I understand culturally what excites people because I live in the culture and mm -hmm. breathe it and study it. But, you know, I'm a part of it as well. You know what I mean? So when I see something, I discovered a lot of cool stuff off Instagram. Like there's right. all these great people doing this stuff on Instagram and we start following each other. And I'm like, wow, you got all this cool art. We should do a book of it or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Or you got all this photography. We should, you know what I mean? Or whatever. And so, um, you know, um, I think, you know, it, it's it's just about trying to find something that, that I believe and love and think that other people will, and then just trying to help get it out there. So, you know, song, book, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. What's the last great book you read? What's the that? Obstacle is the Way. The Obstacle is the Way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, read it. It's dope. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and The Life of Curtis Snow. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, my life as a G, the autobiography of Curtis Snow on Over the Edge Books That's for sale book. on Amazon, Nook, and iTunes. <laughs> That's what's up. It's yeah. a great book. When's the Paul Stewart book coming? Good question. I'm working on it. Um, you know, I want the book company to be a big success, and I can have my swan song kind of. You know, it's something yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of tap. But I, I am working on it. I mean, I got crazy stories and this and that. You know, um, I want to tell other people's stories first, and mm -hmm. then I'll get to it. You know, it's the plan. Dope. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, man. man it's been thanks great for to having have you. It was wonderful. Right on. We'll come back anytime you you got books to promote. All right, cool. Maybe you're going to have Darlene on. I would love to have Darlene on. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll do it. Dope. Thank you. Nice. You guys like that one? If you're into 90s hip hop, there's a lot of good stories there. Hopefully, some brought up some good memories for you. I know it did for me. Next week, We'll probably talk about something totally different. So tune in and find out.